You were against same-sex marriage, now you're for it. You defended President Obama's immigration policies, now you say they're too harsh. You supported his trade deal dozens of times. You even called it the gold standard. Now, suddenly, last week, you're against it. Will you say anything to get elected? Well, actually, I have been very consistent over the course of my entire life. I have always fought for the same values and principles. You uh, kind of have a little segment about uh, the Democratic Party headquarters group and the news and the candidates. Uh, somebody wants to join, I'll just go and say, welcome, uh, David Filippo, who is a guy from our revolution, from what I remember. And, uh, I mean, regardless of what's going on with TYT right now, we're probably going to work with Justice Democrats, and we're de definitely going to work with a modified version of their, uh, and I don't know what that guy's na name is, but you can go to, I think it's episode 7, maybe 8, where uh, I use his platform. It's as good as any other progressive platform, Bernie's platform, whatever. And ours will probably be something along the lines and for now we'll just say that's what it is right it's something like uh, Bernie's or uh, like what the what Bernie tried to get pushed through during the uh, campaign uh, or during I remember him being having some people on the council that tried to make the Democratic parties uh, the fake Democratic Party the official OF first two letters of official obviously fake so uh, Democratic Party uh, so I mean by now you must understand that the Democratic Party headquarters is the home of the reboot if you don't know what the reboot is uh, well I've changed the pin post so many times now I don't have an example here, but the reboot is what we want to do is reboot the Democratic Party, start it by scratch pretty much, and require that you uh, that you do not support any candidates that are legally bribed, you know, like Hillary Clinton, uh, like Cenk Uger. <laughs> God, I hate to add, add him to the list, huh? But 20 million, that's a pretty big bribe, right? And I have no doubt that he's trying to take care of his peeps, right? That's what people call them now. But boy, he, he blew it. Anyway, so the Democratic Party headquarters is the home of the reboot, and um, we don't accept any members and we are the Democratic Party but we're the real Democratic Party all we're keeping is the name okay now this is an essential point we do not accept anybody who's establishment in any way so no DWS Debbie Wasserman Schultz no DNC um, I heard a couple of other uh, names mentioned like D CCC or something DSCC just there's all kinds of uh, organizations that claim to be running the Democratic Party even though they're not they're not I found out the other day when I went and called this guy not Tim Canova this guy Stephen Jaffe you don't have to take any money or share any information or do anything with the DNC. He said, "No, they haven't even uh, <laughs> haven't even contacted me." They uh, so apparently he burns, huh? I mean, Stephen Jaffe must burn. <laughs> so the Democratic uh, National Committee uh, it, it puts its hand out and tries to touch Stephen and tss, ow 
Ow, it burns. <laughs> and hopefully that'll be the case with all these people. I like this girl. I'm the only one who's actually posted a proper uh, post here so far. This is Democratic Party headquarters reboot candidates. And I think that's pretty obvious. I will only approve posts that are like this. So you've got a candidate for whatever. I believe she's running for governor now. I mean, imagine that. A year or something on the city council and bang, you can run for governor. And I'll tell you what. I think I'm going to run against Mitch McConnell. I'm just... I'm just that depressed about Kentucky politics that I, I may just accidentally do what I swore I would not do, and that is, I don't want to be in this. It's just too dirty. It burns, you know? It's like a bad case of uh, herpes or something, politics, right now. So you got Nina Turner, and God, I can't believe she lost. I mean, I thought she was still a senator. She should be, that's for sure. I wonder who's in her place. And I'm going to stop and start learning all this stuff about who's running in every little office. Uh, and of course, Tim Canova is the pinned post. And this explains to you, if you'd like to nominate a person as a reboot candidate, simply post their info to the group. Obviously, you have to join to do this. And if accepted, I will simply leave the post on the group's timeline. The post should include as much information, without going crazy, on your nominee that you can find. Below is an example. Only acceptable candidates, I will vet them to make sure they aren't taking legal bribes, will remain on the timeline. Members can comment about the candidates and by that I mean you can go down here and you can say comment I mean if you're a member then you can comment obviously and so uh, this is an example so I put his website which the first thing you post I mean the first thing the first link you put in now that's going to show up down here so you might want to think about that you don't want to post like I hate timcanova.com as your first post well, you get my point, right? You don't, you want it to be as relevant as possible, so I post their, you know, official site when I, when I post, and then I, in this case, I post Wikipedia second, which I usually leave it for last, but it's good to have a wiki entry because that's kind of impartial, and it, just the history of the candidate, uh, they're, you know, sometimes if it's a good one, it'll give a lot of information where they grew up, what they did. It'll for sure give their political history. Uh, their Facebook, which is great. Twitter. And it says, if the links you provide, provide the candidate's phone number, email, and district, then you won't need to have to post them in the post. So, like here, I didn't post something here that said his phone number and stuff like that because I found them in the other links that I posted and then I said you might want to also add and oh that's a serious misspelling isn't it even though I could give a shit about misspellings but let's just go ahead and say it may actually be so add, and we can do this, make it look a little better. Why you are nominating this candidate? In this case, it's because Tim is running against Health Fund every Washerman Schultz. Oh yeah, and I, I know this has been wrong for a long time. Okay, so <laughs> I, I made a couple of corrections while here on DHPQ News. So that's Democratic he Headquarters uh, reboot candidates, and I believe I've covered them. Covered it before, but cover it again. So we're done with that. Um, this is uh, 
Democratic Party headquarters news. Mostly it's about the group. I'm going to mostly cover the group, but I will also cover issues that are relevant to the group. But I'm not going to cover uh, Ronnie Rump. I mean, I'm bored shitless with Ronnie Rump. I could give a shit. Uh, why would you pile up, why would you create a news site that's all about Ronnie Rump and what a scumbag he is? I mean, first of all, you're doing exactly what she said you wouldn't do, and that's uh, giving him airtime. Morons. You know. And then on top of that, what can anybody say about Ronnie Rump that hasn't been covered in the last year and a half? Well, what's it been now since he's been president? It's 2017. I guess he's only been president for six months. Oh my god. And I've, I know everything about him, right? I know about his ties to the mafia, the deals that he's made. I know about the Russian guy who came to Trump Tower and walked out owning five condos in, in New York, which was obviously money laundering, but hey, nobody seems to be able to file a lawsuit against him, even though it's obviously money laundering. <laughs> so I know, and here I am, see? See how easily you get lured in? I'm not going to cover this guy. I'm not going to talk, I mean, I will talk to him only in, just like I did, how it's relevant to our war against the establishment. This news show is about the war against the democratic establishment. And the reason is simple. Uh, what am I going to do? Go become a Green Party? which I'm already a member of the Green Party, or at least I'm on their site and on their group and registered with them or became a member, uh, you know, online. But what am I going to do? Am I going to vote for a Green Party candidate and get 1 or 2 percent or even who knows what they could do and, and then lose? Then lose? Okay, so that's not an alternative. Okay, so another alternative. Am I going to vote for the Clintons and the establishment Democrats? No fucking way, man. I mean, that would stab me to my core to vote for people who don't give a shit about Americans any more than the Republicans and only give a shit about making their own uh, money and then, oh, well, how could we make all that money and promote ourselves and and uh, and be powerful and everything. Oh, I know. We'll pretend like we're progressives. So they'll pretend like they're me, huh? And they'll pretend like they're Bernie. And they'll even uh, pull in people like Bernie, huh? Here, come on, anti-establishment. Come on. I, I hate to use the term progressives because I know there's tons of progressives out there who are not, I mean, I could say they're not progressives. So I hate to use that term. I'm going to use a term I made up a long time ago, but I officially uh, called it a, a term that I'm going to use, and that's anti S Dems. So anti establishment Democrats. And we are officially the other. Democrats, okay? We are what the Justice Democrats were supposed to be, even though they've sold out now, apparently, and we'll find out whether Justice Dem I mean, how can Justice Democrats sell out? Justice Democrats are all about not accepting money from, but then Cenk Uger goes and takes money. $20 million. $20 million. And he did it in January, and I didn't even hear about it until yesterday. I'm like... <laughs> I can't even express it. Anyway, I don't want to, even though it's just beating me uh, over my head, you know, every five seconds, this thing that, oh, God. So we're anti S Dem. Okay. Backseat to no one when it comes to progressive values. I take a backseat to no one when you look at my record and standing up and fighting for it.
go on. Okay, so here you go. This is where I found out. Okay, Judy Turrentine, thank you very much for ruining my day. <laughs> Seriously, though, you did. But, hey, um, I've said many times that I consider it, and I'm not religious, but a blessing when somebody proves me wrong. Uh, so I back uh, TYT, and hey, it's because we don't have a whole lot of places to turn, right? I'm going to go check out a few other people. I mean, I know that Real Progressives is good, except for the couple of them bore me to death, and they have shows that bore me to death, like about monetary policy and stuff. I mean, just stab me through the brain and send me back to my uh, macroeconomics class or something like that. I, I just, I don't, I'm not interested. But everybody there has their heart in the right place. And there's a lot of other ones too. I think uh, the other one I've seen is the Humanist Report. Go check that out. And I would like to, because uh, I'm only going to be able to produce a show for maybe an hour or two every day, maybe more, because I, I love doing this. I love telling people about what's going on. I love helping people. I love helping people get the news uh, that's better than the news that you get. I love people getting information like this. You know, this is just absolutely uh, essential information here. So thank you, Judy. Thank you for posting that. And I posted this down below. And this is, Chink Uger sent me an email, uh, and I sent him one back, and it says, I get it now, and it, it, uh, it posts a link that's to, uh, well, I can't really click on it, because it's a, this is a graphic, but, uh, you know, I sent him a letter, email, saying, I get it now. No wonder the so show has turned into another boring show about DJT. And there's no progress with uh, Justice Democrats. I mean, I noticed that they weren't adding any new uh, people. And there's only about ten in there right now. And uh, that you're not really able to become a member. It's like they chopped off its head. And I said, you're a sellout, Chank. So, yeah, laugh all the way to the bank then realize that the bank is in hell. <laughs> How is that for an email? So, Judith Mosier Bateman says, I have always been suspicious of Chank when he reluctantly put his po support behind Hillary. Yeah, I noticed that too, Judith. And I was really like, hey, you know, this is bad when that happened. In the primaries, while Bernie was surging and taking state after state, I only watched Jimmy Dore, and Jimmy Dore is awesome. And I would like to be able to find his show by itself. As a matter of fact, I would like to see him take Cenk's place. In her. Backseat to no one when it comes to progressive values. I take a backseat to no one when you look at my record and standing up and fighting for truth. For one, I'm Jewish, and for two, I represent an African American district. Ku Klux Klan and Nazis. Purpose is to keep. Okay, so we all get that. Uh, what I'd like to say here is that, hey, you know, KKK, Nazis, they're not new. <laughs> I mean, they've been on the decline since the 60s in the 80s and 90s and since then they worked to rebuild their numbers and they picked the most you know the most angry people that they can you know that's their that's their key right they see and I don't mean key like in power or life force I mean that's the key to their success is they find people they go places where people are especially in poorer areas where blacks and whites are at each other's throats because they're all poor. <laughs> I 
not because they particularly hate each other's skin color but you end up with that right and so anyway so uh, Michaela Larson and uh, the Democratic establishment because as far as I'm concerned they're uh, you know they're part of the whole racist thing too and I think Hillary basically is a racist obviously she's trained herself maybe even believes that she's not but uh, Michaela stop uh, stop messaging me please with these another Trump post yeah you know I'm getting sick of Trump posts people this group is not about Trump except for one thing and that is that the only way like Bernie would have beat Trump now you can argue with me about that all you want but I think it's your arguments are bullshit, okay? Bernie would have beat Trump, and progressives, real progressives, will beat all of you. Will beat all of the tro hill trolls, will beat all of the Republicans. Uh, once we get rid of the hill trolls so that we're the ones going up against Republicans, we're going to beat you all, okay? We're going to beat you all. We're going to take over. We're going to run things right. And everybody's going to see, just like they do see already. Very often we get things through. Uh, Obamacare was just an example. It wasn't the right thing. But as soon as, I mean, look at all the millions of people who've been helped. And who's really been hurt? I mean, do you honestly think that uh, premiums would be any lower without Obamacare? No. They'd be higher. I mean, I watched from uh, the 90s through uh, Bush, and I mean, back in the 90s, I was I was being charged and like 25, 30 dollars a month for a health care plan, and then it went up around 2002, so to around a hundred a month. And in the meantime, I'm hearing all these horror stories. People paying $700 a month to cover their family and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was skyrocketing. If anything, it leveled out a bit under Obamacare and didn't really get all that much higher. And it, the reason it did get higher was because the capitalists were trying to sabotage Obamacare. Now, Obamacare is not the solution and it has so many screw-ups right and they still don't compete for they don't give us the cheap meds and all that kind of stuff you know from Canada or what have you all around the world I mean, we could be buying uh, our uh, oxycotton from India couldn't we probably cost one tenth the amount and we could have all our drug addicts uh, getting lots of drugs cheap <laughs> I'm being facetious. I'm being sarcastic. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, somebody here is a Obama fan, and he's going to talk about, you know, Obama, yeah, sure. And we're going to talk more about NTS Dems. Of course, we have to talk about the establishment Dems that will we're going to have to beat. Okay, Patricia Wright says, I don't care about Kanye and Kim and Will and Cade and OJ or Cap or the NFL. Okay, well, I do care about Cap and the NFL. Not the NFL, but about his standing up to them. I don't care about nursing mothers, working mothers, single mothers or unwed mothers I don't care about you or me only us and I don't care if you think I'm brilliant crazy or conspiracy theory or a bitch I say oh we will win alright and I think this girl must have just woke up on the wrong side of the bed I like your confidence don't know what it's based on but I like it well, you could say I simply base it on math. 
we're trending and I think it's just the bottom of the curve which by that I'm talking about okay so you got a graph and you got a curve and and this is us and we're just right here and we're going to continue up like this and then she says oh googly goo and she's not she's not impressed by what I had to say uh, she doesn't believe that math she thinks it's more than math well, I didn't say it was just math she just said she disagreed with me so I gave her a argument as to why she shouldn't disagree with me so then she disagrees with me again and it seems to me like she finally saw the light and decided to back off because she could have just complained again about what I had to say or maybe she couldn't argue with what I said because I said well I'm able to predict trends rather well and set them to and I could point out a lot of things uh, I'm an inventor and uh, uh, come up with a lot of ideas I'm very creative I have I'm a musician and I'm a writer and I've got my own TV show here <laughs> so it's not just math in this case I would say a good idea is like a bad cold that won't go away socialism communism caring about people or whatever you want to call it is a good idea that the rich have been trying to crush for thousands of years but it just won't go away that's because it's not just a good idea it's an amazing great idea that is full of karmic ramifications and everything else so I think it's finally trending as I said above but that might but then maybe it isn't yet but it will <laughs> and what a point huh what a good point I'm making here is that being a good person and caring is an idea and that it, it it just never goes away I mean it seems like everybody talks about being good you know and doing what's right and not being tempted by money and evil and all that kind of stuff uh, we get into that constantly almost every segment is really there's a backbone a back a basis uh, a uh, foundation in being good and caring and I guess now I'll just get into this because I wanted to get into it earlier and what is it to be good uh, you get people like Russell Brand who say well there is no such thing as good and evil and there's no good and evil acts but then you know he'll contradict himself yeah, two seconds two sentences later but anyway you get those kind of people though I mean I've had all kinds of crazy people tell me uh, and they end up being crazy and they end up being people you can't depend on and you can't trust because uh, they'll say well reality is just what's in my head so what I think my opinions and I'm like that's not reality you know just because you think that there's an elephant watch, walking across your room doesn't mean there is or whatever I mean so what they're trying to say though is that well what's in people's heads is of significance and I'm not going to argue that but these people who think that they make up reality as they go along <laughs> they're just they're just self-centered they like to believe everything centers around them and what they think and that's not the way it works um, we all have a model of reality in our head an image or whatever you want however you want to think of it and really what it comes down to is how smart you are depends on how well that model in your head matches up with reality reality right so obviously Republicans their model which is all about justifying why they shouldn't have to care about anybody else in this country the other citizens and why they have a, some kind of right to uh, everything they've got and at, even though it was gotten at the expense of everybody else in the country so obviously their model 
does not my match up with reality, they're wrong, okay? Uh, how to be a good person, I'm not going to go into it all right now. I have a massive amount of philosophy on that subject, but uh, some of the things that stick out immediately are like uh, I'm sitting in my car with one of the employees uh, and I say to him, okay, say there's a thousand dollars in a paper bag. Uh, under your feet and you manage to steal it without me ever knowing without anybody able to prove it you get away with it scot-free nothing no penalties and I say to him well, uh, is that good for you or bad for you and they're like well that's good for me I got it and I say to them well I'm not gonna miss that thousand dollars you know, I'm going to go along just fine, and get my dinner and my food, my house over my head, whatever. I will survive, and I will come out of it, and over time, I will, uh, you know, get over it. But you, my employee, <laughs> I don't remember exactly who it was that I was telling this, but I've told lots of people this you're a thief you stole from somebody who didn't have money and uh, obviously your intention is to hurt them obviously it's more important to you that you get that thousand dollars and you know go whoring around with it or whatever you do than the fact that I need it so you you know, I get over it, but you are a scumbag thief for the rest of your life because everything you do becomes a part of you. And maybe on past that life, right? Okay, so that's enough. That's as much as I can uh, impart in, in one segment, but I'll get into uh, the arguments, huh? Because that's what it is, right? You need those arguments in your head you need to be able to understand because if you don't understand how you're screwing yourself when you're being a dick or a, a bitch or whatever then you'll just go ahead and do it every time right you'll go ahead and steal from people I mean if you're gonna steal from somebody have some balls you know go try and steal from a rich person or something at least there's some kind of argument to be made uh, but don't be a chicken shit and steal from people like yourself who don't have money or whatever. So anyway, that's enough of that. So, Willie Watson, who I have not seen any of this, or I don't remember this comment. Uh, it says, uh, it isn't over until we win. And sure, that makes perfect sense. And then, of course, we have to continue to win continue to hold power or I guess until all human beings are dead <laughs> well that's a foregone conclusion I don't know that you needed to even say that anyway those are the only two possible outcomes well no there's another outcome Willie and we've been living with it for as long as I know and that's where they win that's where establishment Democrats win and we end up with mass incarceration end up with taking the food out of babies mouths and all in the name of oh oh we're such good Democrats we're taking care of the people we're Clintoons that's all they are they're just they they don't do they they're just fake they're fake Democrats they're not real uh, Jeff Tobiason says, for the most part, very well said and right on point. I am not quite there on your attack of Rachel because I am quite convinced that Trump is a crook. Yeah, but, you know, an hour every night of sitting around listening to Rachel Maddow. And by the way, that's not how you spell her name because I'm sure that they're talking about Rachel Maddow. Is not not productive we have to talk more about taking over the Democratic Party before we worry about Trump and, and these other people 
you know, if we win the primaries and all these other, uh, if we win in all these different races against establishment Democrats, it's just uh, domino, right? I mean, then the Republicans go down. Uh, if you don't believe me, try it. Elect a bunch of progressives in and see if they don't beat the Republicans all over the country. And once we do that, I mean, I have to think that Democrat, establishment Democrats, have been part of this corruption like gerrymandering of districts. Um, and we saw how adept the DNC and Hillary Clinton are at stealing an election against Bernie, right? I mean, I don't have any doubt about that. So, if we don't get into power and end that, which will be a death nail for the Republicans, right? As well as the establishment Democrats. If we don't get in there, you know, so give us our chance. Let us get in there, put an end to uh, uh, all the money and all those kind of things, everything, the whole thing. Just go look at the platform that I posted that where I adopted the uh, Justice Democrats platform. Uh, if we don't get in there and do that, then we're, we're never going to find out how good our ideas are. And I say, it sounds like you have watched this where I explain DPHQ has adopted Justice Democrats, so I'm already thinking ahead. And pr Patricia says, I didn't see this, but, you know, great minds think alike. So by the end of all this, I think Patricia was starting to realize that, I mean, everybody seems to come at me like I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I mean, really? You people need to get your shit together, man. <laughs> I do know what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm not willing to say I'm never wrong. I admitted that I shouldn't, probably shouldn't have trusted Cenk, Cenk over at uh, TYT. Uh, and I'm the first person to, and here we can get uh, into a very important point about good and evil and, and okay. Uh, you should be willing to admit when you're wrong. As a matter of fact, in my case, I love it when somebody proves me wrong. I'm the first person to admit when I'm wrong because I think it's a gift because you're being given the answer, right? You're being given the truth. How can you look at that as bad people get all upset and they try and defend themselves all to the end of fucking time? Uh, that's how they are, right? Uh, now, I can understand some of you have some huge arguments and you want to try and protect those arguments and you want to try, but for the people who are just uh, just hard-headed, stubborn, and not willing to admit they're wrong, like talking to people who sit in front of the, uh, you know, back in the Bush years, I used to argue constantly because I was a Democrat Democrat and one of the bad Democrats. You know, I just supported blindly our side. But for the people who I was fighting with, who obviously didn't know what they were talking about, and they were just regurgitating Fox News, uh, you know, and would never admit that was that was that's been a neocon philosophy that I learned not to do, but I learned about from my parents. You never admit you're wrong. You never show any sign of weakness. Uh, what a what a waste of your life, huh? Go through your whole life defending your your weaknesses, defending your bad traits, your bad characteristics. Don't waste your life like that. Stop and and analyze what you believe in when people uh, question you, and get on. I mean, take five seconds and Google it. Uh, go and read a couple of articles. Understand, uh, like, even though I don't trust Russian television half the time, uh, question more. 
And I mean, they did grab a good uh, catchphrase, right? Sent and received. About half were work-related and went to the State Department, um, and about half were personal that were not... For the direct quote, when you talk to the public, you say, I turned over everything. 90 to 95 percent of my work-related emails were in the state system. If they wanted to see them, they would certainly have been able to... You know what? That, that is... Federal states, including Ohio and Pennsylvania. Okay, this is a post by Linda Rothwell. Scott Baio's wife tells Sandy Hook, Mom, her child is better off dead than living with her ugliness. And, uh, you know, Scott Baio has been in and out of the news being some kind of slime bag. But apparently his wife, uh, you know, the beautiful people, right? Calling everybody else ugly, even people who lost their children. And so I don't know where these people get. I mean, deplorables is an awful thing to call somebody. And it was originally used against Bernie, against me. Uh, they called us a basket of deplorables. And then uh, she kind of slid it over to mean Trump supporters and I don't know is Scott Bale a Trump supporter but I have a different problem with all this uh, and people are just getting really upset with uh, Scott Bale's wife here heartless bitch uh, and I say the whole happy days crowd is turning out to be a bunch of conservative nut jobs and Jeff Hendren very quickly says Ron Howard because I mean we're talking about Opie right <laughs> cute little kid and I say yeah well I got sick of the white films with the token minorities in there. I do like his films, but the fact is he's part of a segment of Hollywood that is all about itself. You know, and it's so true. All about the glory of the white race. Tom Hanks at least will do one propaganda film like Big or Saving Private Ryan. And I'm not saying these things are outwardly racist, but they, they certainly paint white people as being these horribly good people, you know, all of them. You know. And then, of course, the white kid goes to New York City and all the minorities are shooting at each other and he's scared. And, you know, it's all, I, I hate to tell you this, but it's all kind of a, it's kind of planned, right? to uh, make people not like minorities and to like white people. So I say, uh, Private Ryan, then turn around and do something interesting like Cloud Atlas. So Tom Hanks, he, he flip-flops. I mean, you can go through his films and he does that on purpose because it's like one film is uh, pretty much a propaganda film and then the next one is more of a liberal kind of film so uh, or something Penny Marshall and Howard make great films and I loved Mayberry but I realized they were trying to avoid all the ugliness of the white race the old shows like Happy Days portray an America that was protected by racism and think about that huh that America where Americans didn't even really ever think about black people, you know? They didn't think about uh, people living without electricity or running water, 
just outside of town or people being lynched they just thought about their daily lives so uh, realized they were trying to avoid all the ugliness of the white race the shows like Happy Days portray you know okay even the song which sucks and I think Rock Around the Clock did suck it was just made famous through promotion by racists um, which sucks was a way to say rock and roll belong to white people and the song wasn't rock and roll or rock it wasn't a rock song it wasn't a rock and roll song certainly not like uh, Chuck Berry's songs I mean Chuck Berry's songs were rock and roll songs right uh, he wrote uh, it's only rock and roll you know that you hear the uh, uh, of course you know a lot of the songs that he did and I'm not going to get into all of them but they were real rock and roll songs you know by definition whereas Rock Around the Clock was it was kind of a bebop kind of song or something I don't know not not rock or rock and roll okay so and I'm a musician so and uh, my music uh, expertise is rock and roll and rock that came after it and then hard rock and uh, metal and, and all that progressive uh, classic rock so I know what I'm talking about here just like I, I know you're going to be like oh god this guy thinks he knows everything well I do get around uh, I am an expert in computers. I am an expert in uh, uh, music. Uh, you can go listen to my music on here. So anyway, so I know what I'm talking about here when it comes to what is rock and what is rock and roll. A lot of it comes from just watching documentaries like uh, uh, PBS had a whole series of documentaries on rock and roll. I watched them learned a lot there a lot of what I know is out of there and then there's just you know 50 years of, <laughs> of being into rock so I say uh, but it was made to marginalize real rock and rock and roll legends like Chuck Perry and Little Richard and others even the name rock and roll was a black term that referred to the rock and roll of a trailer when sex was going on inside and a black person would turn to their friend and say rock and roll and somehow the less blatantly propagandist, propagand, propagandistic shows it's hard for me to even read my own <laughs> words some of them are kind of long uh, shows are even more offensive to me just like establishment Democrats are offensive to me because they pretend to be me you know they want to claim all my virtues uh, political virtues it's a more subtle form of propaganda which supports a far less subtle form of terrorism and, and oppression and Jeff says, I'm sorry he's not liberal enough for you. And he says, that's me rolling my eyes. And I say, it's his connection to propaganda movies. And I say, and they are good. Just like Casablanca was good. Casablanca was just a flat out propaganda movie. But God, you gotta love the movie. And I say every, every once in a while, real talent meets propaganda. White House blocked opposition from labor and environmental groups, and she was the featured speaker at a crucial meeting.
for fire in Tuzla, Bosnia, something that didn't happen. But CBS News has found several times in the past few months when Senator Clinton used the Bosnia trip to try to show her international experience. December in Iowa. Okay, they're talking about <clears throat> Harvey, of course, which is a fascinating subject, huh? And I don't really want to get into the climate change issue because I don't think there's any argument there. I mean, and I think the only reason that it's even covered on the news anymore is because it's a foregone conclusion that humans are altering the the weather so I don't the only reason that they still cover it is because you've got these idiots out there trying to claim that it's you know not not actually real <laughs> otherwise I don't think it would even make the news they just uh, do the news under the assumption that, you know, that's, you know, they just, well, you know how a conversation goes. Uh, when something is assumed, you don't bring it up over and over again trying to say that it it's real. You just kind of do the whole conversation and that. So anyway, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, now, the economics. Uh, poor people are forced to live in these areas. There's economic reasons. I'm not going to go into every single one of them, but uh, you know these people. Um, so you've got these areas that are low lying, right? And uh, well, I am going to go into it a little bit. So you, so uh, they get flooded a few times. Or maybe they don't, but maybe some of them are just known to be low-lying areas. Whatever. The people who live there... Uh, I don't want to make this horribly racial, but it's probably white people. And then they say to themselves, well, uh, you know, they get better jobs. And they say, well, we could do better. This house is old. I'll sell this house and get another house. A newer house. And just as a white person I know a lot of white people who do that and okay we'll, we'll call white people rich and black people poor just for the sake of argument here so I'll say rich people they you know they own multiple houses and then poor people they maybe never get to buy a house so they have to rent or maybe they do get to buy a house but they're funneled into areas now and then rich people they get to choose where they live so they live in these nicer areas and gee they never seem to flood these areas that they move to are just an inch above the floodplain or something like that and the floodplain, by the way, is a well-known thing. As is pollution areas, well-known things. So when these houses, you know, I'm not saying all uh, rich people are evil and they automatically uh, sell their house in a bad area or put apartments or put houses in bad areas to hurt poor people but they do whether they do it on purpose or not and like I said the pol 
pollution and the floodplain are well known. Uh, maybe some of them do it on purpose, maybe some of them don't, but it happens and that is provable because it's obvious, right? Because people knew, it's just like people knew the cigarette companies knew that cigarettes hurt people, killed people. They went ahead and, you know, you know that story, right? If you don't, you should. And all these same, you can kind of put all these things in the same category where uh, rich people hurt poor people. And rich people like to talk about class warfare, but they hate to talk about class, class warfare when it comes to things like this. Okay, so these poor people, they don't have a choice but to live in there, right? Well, if we didn't know exactly what the cost is going to be, all these people, and if you don't pay the cost, then people die, right? Katrina was the perfect example of that. And you had <laughs> Blackwater employees uh, guarding all the rich people there and things like that. Just the crazy insane, uh, they, they call it cray cray now, uh, of a thing like this. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that, uh, the, in the end, even for rich people, they can understand this, the cost is horrendous. The cost is far, far higher than not building houses below the floor, uh, the the uh, floodplain, and not building houses in pollution areas, and then obviously not building polluters in the people areas in the, and then not polluting in the first place. I mean, they could actually build these places, uh, you know, not far from people if they didn't pollute when there's a flood, you know, and all the water mixes with all the horrible chemicals and everything. Uh, we've seen that. I, I saw that over and over again. Certainly, I remember it in Katrina. Now, those people know that when it floods and that water mixes with Okay, again, I'm telling you, they know, they know. And if they didn't know, then they knew after the first time it ever happened, which was probably 200 years ago, 300, 400, 500, who knows how long, as long as there's been flooding. Any uh, industrial site, uh, I'm sure it's happened over and over again. So they know. As a matter of fact, that's another reason why I can say they probably know when they build these places and when they start polluting and when they store these chemicals like they do and they probably know and in Texas I happen to know that Shell uh, had dumping pits for all their worst chemicals and that they built houses well these big pits they just covered them over with dirt or whatever and then they sold these to all it was all minorities there wasn't a black person in these neighborhoods bought a house. I mean, a white person. If there was, they were very few. And then all, all they all started dropping dead, right? I remember that. Because uh, I lived in Houston for nine years. From like 83 to uh, 91. Uh, eight years, nine years, something like that. So, uh... And, and I learned a lot in Houston. Uh, now, uh, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about that. But the side story is uh, I'll get into uh, about how I ended up in Houston and why it taught me a lot about neocons. And the main reason is because Houston became a hub for neocons who had been traveling around the world doing the oil company's dirty work, like my dad. Uh, 
most of the time my dad was doing neocon dirty work uh, the PLO uh, the Mujahideen in Saudi Arabia raising the basically Al Qaeda to create the Mujahideen so he had ended up uh, very associated with all the oil company dirty work around the world where they where the neocons have lots of experience with building plants and hurting people right and and doing oil business and mining and stuff and hurting people lots and lots of experience because they do it far egregiously to people who can't fight back and poor people in the United States can't fight back and so we ended up in Houston uh, not going to go into the exact details first we ended up in New York City working for this ultra wealthy Saudi Arabian because uh, to be quite honest I don't think Singer uh, well there was some politics going on so anyway that that's probably a really long story and I'm not going to get into that but we ended up down in Houston and uh, we went through Hurricane Alicia which wasn't that bad except for it was pretty bad right along uh, uh, Galveston and it wiped out most of those houses on the uh, the island which is the reef really built up so we've been wiping out reefs for a 200 years I mean that that island's been built out for a long up for a long time but only rich people own houses out there and of course they weren't there they're like summer houses you know beach houses up on stilts and uh, of course when the wind hits them they just fold like guards right so uh, anyway what was my point my point was that we ended up in Houston where all these people and uh, well I'm not going to talk about that now because this is about climate change and and poverty the uh, only other point I wanted to make was about rich people now they get to uh, <coughs> build their houses and put their house and buy houses wherever they want so generally speaking they don't end up in these polluted uh, flooded areas right and they love to say well I mean this is really obnoxiously rude and I'm just going to preface it by saying what happens to uh, well because of where they decide to live and choose to live rich people sometimes very rarely end up suffering for choosing to be in those places because while everything is done to make sure that they're safe in their houses uh, every once in a while you get wildfires and these people get burned out of their homes and I see these people on TV and they're all crying and whining and there's only a few of them you know maybe a hundred of them uh, in a wildfire have to move and their houses get burned or whatever and sometimes some, once in a while some of them get killed right and we're supposed to all feel sorry for these people and the news media goes on and on and on about how these people are losing their homes even though really they really did choose to live there knowing uh, you know I see that and I see people with houses near the ocean and their houses are falling into the ocean because the climate change is eating away at the the seashore and it causes the cliff they're living on to okay all these kind of things were rich people and uh, we're all supposed to feel horribly sorry for them but the millions of poor people who are affected by we uh, unless democracy now decides to do a piece like this 
Um, well, we might hear about them kind of in an offhand kind of way. And we'll hear some asshole rich person come along and say, well, you know, they didn't have to live there. Oh, bullshit. Poor people don't get to choose where they live. They either live there because of their job and that's the only place you know if that's if you're looking for houses and those places are the only places that are even available to you you don't have a choice so like I said I use the word funnel and that's what rich people do is they funnel these people into these bad areas and, and then they have the nerve to get on TV and say well uh, you know, they chose to live there. And I'm sure it's because when they see a, a wildfire burn down a rich man's person's house and they hear other people saying, well, you know, these people have millions of dollars and they decided to, you know, they wanted that house. You know, they wanted that house like Iron Man's house on the ocean right there on the edge of the ocean and then there was an earthquake and that house fell into the ocean well it didn't but you know whatever so uh, so yeah I mean I mean what I'm saying makes perfect sense right and uh, I don't see anybody talking about these things even these people God love them they're covering this uh, as best they can, but you know, maybe they don't have the experience or don't remember, or so, in, or more more likely, they're just covering it from the perspective that that uh, it's news and and their knowledge. So I just thought I'd give another perspective, and let's hear what's you know this regenerative. and learn from them you know this is this is uh, such an important moment not just for us here on the Gulf Coast but for the entire country and I want to thank you know organizations and individuals who have been at the forefront of so how many times are we going to say this we must learn from these things I mean it's not like this is the first time that this and, and of course all the pictures of people having to pick up and run are, are black, right? For using this hurricane, this tropical storm, as an excuse. It's, it's possible. You know, that's, that's the really scary part. I mean, we don't know. We're at the behest of the same industries, you know, who are, are making these dangerous chemicals, uh, and, and, and that's that's the most stressful part of these storms, the unknown, um, and, and the constant state of stress of what might happen. Brian Paris, want to thank you for being with us. Organizer with Sierra Club's Beyond Dirty Fuels campaign at Tejas, his group, Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Services, speaking to us from the Petro Metro, from Houston, fourth largest city in the country, which has now been described as apocalyptic. As we report on the toll from flooding after Hurricane Harvey, which has now reached so many lives, I want to turn to Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo, who was speaking on Tuesday when he announced the death of an officer who drowned while reporting. Because Senator Obama chose not to present a universal health care plan does not give him the right to attack me because I did. So let's have a real campaign. Enough with the speeches and the big rep. I think you're Sergeant Perez drove into an underpass that's about 16 and a half feet, drove into the water and he died uh, in a flood, uh, in a drowning type event. So um, we could find him, and uh, once our dive team got there, it was too treacherous to, to go under and look for him. So 
who made the decision to leave officers there waiting until the morning because as much as we wanted to recover him last night, we could not put more officers at risk for what we knew in our hearts was going to be a recovery mission. That's Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo. The chief has also spoken out against a new law set to take effect on Friday in the midst of this storm called SB 4 that lets police officers check the legal status of immigrants they detain. This is Chief Acevedo on Democracy Now! just a few weeks ago. Okay, so they're getting into something else and that'll have to be for a different segment. And my views on these things are a little different from from progressives, but I accept their, you know, if you want to let illegal aliens flood into the country, as crazy as I think that is, uh, you know, okay, we just accept all of Mexico, even though our ancestors fought a horrible war to run them all out of the country. <laughs> I mean, this is the reality. And yeah, you can jump up and down about how wrong it was for all the desperate people for Europe, from Europe to flood into this country and make it America. But I think it's a horrible mistake. Uh, just like if you were an Israeli and 400 years after running the Palestinians out and forming a country and going through all that and doing all the bad things you did uh, so now you're <laughs> you're going to let all the Palestinians come back and you think that oh it's all going to be alright we're all going to live in harmony and happiness well I refer you to previous segments that I've spoken about uh, where I've spoken about uh, what I saw in Beirut Lebanon in the Civil War because Lebanon was a Christian country I mean it had very few Muslims in it and then over the uh, a thousand years it allowed Muslims more and more Muslims and finally the tipping point was because uh, I, I can tell you there were lots of crises with crises that uh, created Muslim refugees and Muslims generally speaking uh, uh, the Shia are very poor and they get run out of other countries but uh, Christianity kind of was the whole, and I'm not Christian, and I hate Christianity. I don't hate the people who practice it, but I do hate the religion. And So when I talk about the Christians in Lebanon, I have no love for them or what they do uh, from a political point of view, polit politics and war. But at the same time, there's lessons to be learned. Uh, uh, you know, they've they've gotten slowly overrun to the point where now uh, they're a minority, and groups like Hezbollah kind of run the country and take take out Christians time to time, not lately, but it happens, and you've got the uh, LAF, Lebanese Armed Forces, and uh, they're all Christian now. When I lived there, there were Christians and Muslims in the Lebanese army, but during the war, the Lebanese army disintegrated because you couldn't have a war between Christians and Muslims and then have the or Christians as Shia, I'd say, Shia and the Palestinians, and have an army that's got Shia in it, right? So you couldn't do that. So it disintegrated, and then uh, really the biggest militia 
the Pierre Jamal militia became the army and they're called the Lebanese Armed Forces and they're just nutty right wing I mean this is what you you end up with for those of you who follow my my uh, Democratic Party headquarters news you'll have heard me talk about the Desaudi experiment which is a book written by Frank Herbert the author of Dune but it was just a really short book or a short story I'm, I don't remember which I think it was a really short book and uh, that's what you end up with in Lebanon is a, a Desaudi experiment and uh, I'm not going to describe it again in this segment Whew, lots of flooding huh now I saw the same thing it used to flood regularly in Houston but uh, maybe not that bad but during uh, Alicia it flooded pretty bad anyway I'll get back into the I, the, the subject of uh, of immigration and why I feel the way I did uh, or why I feel the way I do uh, civil wars are hell on earth manifestation of hell on earth our idea of hell I don't believe in a real hell but they're manifestations of uh, hell on earth the idea what the hell is that oh ants I'm trying to spot yeah, the red ants in, in Houston and around Houston. I ended up getting eaten alive by them one day. Hundreds of them all over me. I was playing paintball with friends and I didn't realize I was rolling around in uh, fire ants. And fire ants were everywhere. I mean, I remember I was sitting on a, uh, a cement uh, on the side of a road maybe waiting for a bus or something and all of a sudden I was like ow and I jumped up and there was a crack in the cement and there were just tons of these red ants coming out after me I mean they really are able to very quickly identify a target and attack and you know this is just another example of rich and poor you know, only a poor person ends up sitting on a, a place waiting for a bus and gets attacked by red ants. Uh, now, <laughs> it's kind of like the the situation I just described about the housing and where people end up living and the things that they are exposed to. Uh, you know, a rich person, because I was rich and then I was poor in Houston. The last year or two, when I graduated from college, uh, my parents left me down there. <laughs> and uh, I remember the first job I got was minimum wage. And they wanted me to sell stuff that you can't sell. But, of course, they want you to to sell as much as you can even though uh, you're there based on commission that you're never going to get this is another situation of uh, what happens in the kind of economic Saudi experiment and who knows what kind of rare strange creatures it creates that become dangerous and detrimental to the community but, uh, so the second job I got was also pretty much minimum wage parking cars. Real quick, basically, I'll just say that uh, I'm afraid of immigration, and so are the people who we hate, the racists. And so aspects of their their argument 
actually have validity based on the kind of survival instinct uh, argument that uh, can be made. I think I'll get a little bit more of this just in case it's... And if that's the case, well, then we're going to avoid a discussion of who, what could have been done to prevent this, which is a very important um, uh, discussion to have. And we're also not going to talk about what we can still do uh, to lower emissions very, very rapidly to prevent a future filled with many more such mega storms and other climate accelerated disasters. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, certainly the media, uh, a lot of the media is extremely critical of President Trump. He flew into Texas yesterday. Um, yes, there was a lot of criticism, but also um, they praised him for going there. But there was almost no discussion of him being a climate denier. Um, if you watch the media, and I'm not even talking about Fox, I'm talking about MSNBC and I'm talking about CNN, almost 24 hours a day on Texas and on the tropical storm, the hurricane, almost no mention, almost no mention of climate change, although they are devoting all of their time to this. You know, we don't have state media in the United States, but if we did, you have to ask how it would be any different. We know that the Trump administration has cleansed websites of the words climate change and global warming. But what about the media? Have they done the same, Naomi? Well, effectively they have. We are seeing this cleansing um, that, ha that, that is happening at, at the White House filter down um, to the media. And it is not just about uh, federal politicians. It's also about state politicians who sit uh, in Texas and Louisiana who systematically deny climate change. Now, if you are denying the reality that the Earth is warming, um, then you are not going to prepare in the same way for, uh, for what we are seeing now, for these unprecedented events. They will take you by surprise. If you deny... So, obviously, there is a de facto Illuminati, is what they're saying. You know... Uh, it doesn't happen in one room with 12 guys getting around a table or maybe it does but it happens in thousands of rooms all around the country with thousands of these thugs and uh, I'm sure that they pressure everybody to, to follow the toe the party line right it's always about towing the party line unprecedented events just like this, and then when the world got serious about lowering emissions, uh, Exxon was a leader in spreading misinformation, doubt, um, lies about the reality of climate change. There is a legal discussion to be having here, and that's the kind of discussion that we need to have. The other thing that is so, you know, you mentioned the fact that, of course, this disaster is being seen through a political lens, right? I mean... Uh. I've got to say that I think that climate change has been going along since the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution, uh, especially since it spread worldwide, and now you've got all kinds of countries like China and India that are industrializing to the point that, you know, Europe did a hundred years ago, and so we can see the graph, right? You can see the graphs. And if they were really faked, as climate deniers claim, then uh, over 50 years, I'm sure, they would have been able to prove that. But they're never able to prove that. So that's just a load, right? <laughs> a crock. Um... to what used to happen after school shootings when you would hear from the NRA crowd right away, don't talk about gun control, don't talk about guns, you're politicizing the disaster. And finally, um, you know, about... Now, Naomi, I've never thought her books were that interesting because I already know everything that she's talking about. But what she's famous for is 
make you know writing these books that basically encapsulate what people like I have known for a long time and putting them out there and so she's like a magnet for uh, to be uh, on talk shows and uh, you know we've been listening to her for 10 years 15 years now I mean it's not like uh, disaster capitalism was really like earth-shattering news to communists like me. I mean... As a communist, I'm not really a communist like most people think of communists. I'm not uh, militant and I, I, I'm not a Marxist. Uh, I don't believe that uh, communism means overthrowing governments and stuff because uh, there's no other way. I don't believe that. As a matter of fact, I think communism is inevitable because of the efficacy of its uh, system. It, it just It's a beautiful thing when it's done uh, completely. But when it's not, when economies become hybrids and I don't believe in communism as anything but an economic model right and when it's done as hybrids and uh, at that point you end up with competition between uh, you know the rich people constantly the capitalists constantly try to take over capitalism because there's or take over uh, the economic system from communism uh, or socialism, whatever you want to call it, because there's profit in it, because they can take it over and run it, sucking the well, su sucking the efficiency of it away and turning it into cash for themselves. Right? I mean, that's what privatization is all about. So, uh, you know, the two systems don't really work very well together unless uh, the socialist side of it is able to uh, retain complete control of the <coughs> essential goods and services in, in the hybrid kind of system. So when... When progressives are strong, uh, the the economy is strong because you have uh, you have to uh, build from the bottom up, as a lot of people of you have heard, you know. In a storm that is more severe, they say it's a 500-year flood. It is not. There is a flood similar in Louisiana. Again, Louisiana hit today, just last year. And there'll be another flood the year after that and the year after that. Any? Okay. Well, uh, it's actually scheduled to come up here and hit us. <laughs> of course, I have no idea what it will be. Looks to me like it's going to be rain, rain. And I would say the reason it's scheduled to hit us is because we don't have really anything much as far as I can see well there's something here and of course I'm just talking to people in Kentucky but uh, I'm saying it's supposed to come up where we are um, I don't see why it's going to come to us I mean it went like this and 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 like this. And like this. Uh, why won't it just go back out and then come back and hit New Orleans and then go back out and come out and hit uh, Florida and Georgia and then tear up the whole East Coast. I mean as long as it's uh, because you know 
tank here is saying that it's like more severe than uh, well wait a minute now you know and I, I hate to be on the climate deniers side but the weather's been really mild where it's been really really bad wow what's this we got three cyclones uh, tor uh, hurricanes going and this one I don't know it looks to me like it's headed west to east this one's headed oh well that's that's Harvey and this one looks like it's going to tear up and I haven't heard anything about any of the other ones well I guess that's because people are dying and in Houston but you know Houston's no big surprise I lived there for nine years uh, a bad rainstorm can kill nine people in Houston no kidding I mean just Houston is just a poorly planned city as far as rain goes they get massive storms in the summer I when I was there it would rain so hard you'd be sitting in your car and you couldn't see the brake lights of the car in front of you and you'd be just sitting there hoping that nobody else was stupid enough to drive you know try and go forward because obviously they'd crash into somebody the person in front of them so yeah nine years in this hellhole Houston fortunately I was part of the uh, I don't know we were neocons you know we'd served the world we served the served our neocon masters well in Lebanon and Indonesia and Saudi Arabia and who knows where else my dad might have gone because I know he made lots of trips uh, I know he mentioned he went to Karachi which is Pakistan ah, another place where all that ties together but Houston the rich people lived in Derry Ashford where we lived and they lived in uh, I forget what the names of the there were some really swanky uh, you know really richy rich areas of town have never flooded hurricane after hurricane uh, and to look at them you gotta think well it's not any different from anywhere else in town but obviously it is obviously it's just on a bit of a hill huh? somewhere the the neighborhoods because they never flood they never flood isn't that amazing anyway I felt like uh, today what I ought to talk to you about and, and let me just mention real quick I hear this stuff from Chank about uh, if I was going to talk about uh, climate change I would talk about India and how hot it got and down here in Arizona and places how hot it got now that doesn't kill Americans because Americans can find a place I mean you can go into a department store if you have to and pretend like you're shopping all day <laughs> if you don't have air conditioning at home or something but and we we used to do that when I was very young and poor uh, but you know I talk about anything but hurricanes because man there have not been big hurricanes I mean you want to talk a big about hurricanes you're going to be talking about the you have to go backwards not forwards because over the last 10 since about 2000 man the hurricanes have been really really rare uh, the big ones um, let's just google top 10 hurricanes of all time so let me set this down for a minute and I will just type in top hurricanes of all time 
Okay. And Hurricane Katrina wasn't even one of the top ten. It was a big hurricane, though, compared to this little one we just had. Okay, the ten worst hurricanes in American history, the Weather Channel. We'll see how well. I'm sure that they're pretty accurate, so. Every hurricane since 1851. So you guys were talking about how it's really hard. To oh my god, they gotta throw an ad in every time you turn around. From Maine to Texas. Uh oh god. Let's let's not look at this because you know what? They're doing it in this form where you gotta go page by page. Um <laughs> fuck it. Let's go to Uh, let's just, you know, it gets to where Google is just fucking useless, man. All it does is take you to page with pages with just shitloads of ads and stuff. So, let's go to Wikipedia and just type in... doing sorry people I hate to waste your time like this but sometimes it's that hard tropical cyclone hurricane redirects here okay let's go down to here and see if we can't find This isn't quite what I'm looking for either. How about if we type in category 5 hurricane. Okay, list of 5 Atlantic hurricanes and list of 5 Pacific hurricanes. Catastrophic damage will occur. Examples of storms that made landfall at Category 5 status include Cuba, 1924, Okeechobee, 1928, Bahamas, 1932, Cuba, and then Brownsville, Texas, 1933, 35, 55, 69 was Camille. Now that was a bad one. That's the one that hit Galveston, I think. 71 Anita. 77 David. 79 Gilbert. 88. 92. 2007. 2007. So we had two Category 5s hit land in 2007. That's interesting. That does make it look like it's getting worse, except for the nothing now in between. And I noticed here that, let's see, it goes from 92, 8 years, 7, so that's 15 years. So, uh, so that's 15 years there. Let's see, and then you go backwards from 1992 to 1988. These two are pretty close together, but then there's about nine years before you get another one, and then two. So you get, they do seem to clump together in twos. 71 and 69 are close together. Oh, and then just one in 55 and one in 35. 35 and 33 and 32 so 32 33 so 
when you go way back, you get 24, 28, 1924, 1928, 1932, 1933, 1935. So I would say that the the hurricanes were much worse back in the 20s and the 30s, right? I mean, that's pretty pretty plain from those. And lately, you just haven't had and you know I miss them. When you see the entire gulf full of a hurricane with 200 plus mile per hour winds at the at the center of them. Let's see if they've got pictures of Camille. Not a very good picture, huh? Camille was the second most intense tropical cyclone to strike the United States on record. I'm sorry, I've got a very dry mouth for some reason. Um, it formed as a tropical depression August 14th south of Cuba. So not far off, really. When you would have thought it started around Africa, they say they all do. Anyway, it located favorable located in a favorable environment for strengthening. The storm quickly intensified to a category two before striking the western part of the nation on August fifteenth, emerging into the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, they were talking about Cuba there. Camille underwent another period of rapid intensification and became a Category 5 hurricane the next day as it moved northward towards the Louisiana-Mississippi region. Despite weakening on August 17th, the hurricane quickly re-intensified back to a Category 5 before it made landfall in Waveland, Waveland Mississippi early in August on August 18th. Okay, I thought Camille hit... One of these hit Galveston. I think one hit way, way back when, maybe. So it has a storm surge of 24 feet. Killed 259 people. And did an equivalent of nearly $10 billion worth of damage. So that's some serious shit, right? I mean, that's where people were flooded by, you know, 25 feet of water. I mean, my God. That would be just horrendous. Okay. I believe in what we will call uh, human global warming. Uh, we can shorten that to HGW if you want. I have no doubt that the uh, and mainly because of the uh, uh, the data. Hmm? Uh, the data comes from all kinds of. Uh, I mean, they keep temperature all everywhere, right? These days, uh, like I could go to here. And I could show you just around, uh, by the way, this is part of global warming. But of course, I'm arguing that it's not necessarily going to lead to more hurricanes. But just as an example of how m much data there is, I will go here to layers and pick temperature. 
So every one of those is a reading from a place. So if I click on this 66 degrees, it shows Lexington, Kentucky. If I click on this, well, it used to do it. Well, it does it kind of automatically. You don't click on them, I guess. But there's Triumph, Nebraska. Each one of these is a reading actually coming from a place where they take readings. I mean, it's amazing what they can do, right, nowadays. And there's the hurricane. It's uh, almost right over us right now. And it's been kind of calm, but this morning it was scary. Not because it was bad, but because it reminded me of Alicia. The clouds were just whizzing by. And I had my window open, and you could just hear this that you didn't, even with a major front coming through and high winds, you did not hear that. That was the sound of a large system. And it was up in the air. It wasn't coming from the trees or anything like that, or the houses or anything. It was up in the air. And it was pretty scary. Uh, apparently they got some pretty serious stuff going down here. I have... Uh, also clicked alert severe and they have tornado uh, watches these are all tornado watches these are severe thunderstorm warnings though the yellow ones so you've got that going on still I mean and um, I could click on flooding and by the way this is a nice site uh, IntelliCast so if you want to check it out and you just kind of have to look around it's uh, an interactive weather map and uh, if you want the uh, forecast you just click on local and put in your uh, zip code zip code area code zip code um, so let's look alerts flood and uh, where I'm at apparently there are still and these have been ongoing and there's flood warnings down here so it is apparently flooding quite a bit uh, as a result of this storm we'll back off again get rid of the uh, temperatures even though the temperatures and, and I was telling uh, actually my mother this morning that it's hard to figure out why this storm would be so cold unless you understand that for every mile an hour the wind is going or say you're driving into the wind or something the temperature will technically drop by a degree so if you're driving 100 miles an hour or if you're in 100 mile an hour winds technically the uh, temperature should drop a hundred degrees but you got all this hot air that's coming into it right and now the speed of the wind has dropped to like 40 miles an hour but what what you end up with is a significant cooling where these uh, where the wind cooled down the air so anyway I'm passing on a little bit of information to you so you've got massive amounts of data um, I trust the people that I've read who are taking that data and making it something that I can understand right I mean what use is millions of numbers if they can't be crunched down and, and uh, what was it in the zero theorem what did they do with entities okay so anyway so <laughs> I know my my mind wanders. I love that movie, by the way, The Zero Theorem. So that's why it's cold, and that's why uh, climate change is complicated. Now I'll tell you what I think. I think that it's hotter because I've seen the data and I've seen the 
you know, people write up what they think about the data. And I think that's what happened. I mean, I know that it's getting colder at the poles. Now, what they said was that it was going to get hotter at the equator, that that was going to be the big thing that happened. But then all they talked about was the poles, the poles, the poles. It's getting warmer, getting warmer. The ice is melting, the ice is melting. And uh, I think they're right. I don't know when we'll see the much hotter temperatures along here through the the uh, it runs probably right here you see where these clouds look kind of line up and this is a major hurricane headed towards the United States um, so before I get to this hurricane talk about this hurricane um, I'll talk about so that heat is coming from here, the North Pole. It's probably up here at the top. So that's warming up, right? Getting less cool. And that cold is circulating into the uh, rest of the, you know, the rest of the weather. And it comes down here and it mixes, and that's what causes hurricanes and tornadoes is hot and cold, uh, evening out, uh, dissipating, whatever you want to call it, uh, what's the scientific word I was taught, uh, well anyway, it's when you have two different, like hot and cold, or salty and not salty, and it all becomes the same after a while, it all goes through the, you know, so it's doing that, so it's getting warmer up here, but then there's the matter of more energy, because you've got the sun and the heat and all the stuff, it's more energy in the system, so it's grabbing more cold from up here and bringing it down. So it's kind of like an ice cube melting, right? And literally it is like an ice cube melting. And when it's done melting, well, then the heat will become unimaginable. I mean, we really will burn up because there will be no more cold up there to bring down. And it'll be bringing hot air down to even hotter air. And uh, I'm sure that's probably, you know, I don't read enough about it, but I'm sure that's probably what a lot of the scientists are afraid of. I mean, I, I'll bet you they're thinking the same thing. And I'm not a scientist, and I can figure it out, right? I mean, whew. And when that happens, I imagine the United States and most of Europe will become uninhabitable just deserts and everybody will want to be in Canada and Northern Europe you know places like Nor Norway and Sweden will become the uh, the great places to live and people will be refugees I mean the refugee crisis that we talk about now well we're gonna be the refugees headed north huh and will the British of Canada be kind to us or will they treat us like we treat Mexicans it's going to be interesting people it's going to be interesting and that's what I say is going to happen I I think I will I think I'm glad that I'll probably be dead by then that's not nice to the people who will be alive but uh, <laughs> I think I'll be glad if I don't live to see that right so I'm 56, going on 57, so 67, 77, so 20 years, and I may get to see the beginning of it, and if this doesn't scare you, then there's something wrong with you, I mean, there really is, but at the same time, what I'm saying is that, um, and here's another thing that uh, I saw, but I don't know 
exactly which video it is, but what they did was they push heat through a, a box or something and uh, then they put a, a thing on the other side that detects heat. It's just like this. You see this picture here? You know how these things work where you look like snipers use them and stuff to detect body heat and stuff like that. So they d did that and then they have a candle on one side of the box and then they have a camera on the other doing that and then they inject the CO2 in and amazing just amazing it just the CO2 just completely blocks the 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 candlelight and what that means is it's absorbing that heat so I liked that um, I mean if you must I can show you a a video and I know I'm kind of boring so maybe we can CO2 carbon dioxide so what's causing the modern warming CO2 carbon dioxide when we look at the history of the climate what we find is that whenever CO2 has been high it's been warm and whenever CO2 has been low it's been cold and we can't explain the size of the temperature changes unless more CO2 makes it warmer. So what does CO2 have to do with temperature? It's simple physics really. More CO2 makes it warmer through the greenhouse effect. The sun sends energy and heats the earth. The earth sends back energy to space and the CO2 gets in the way of some of that. That traps some of the heat here at the earth and keeps us warmer than we would be. Without CO2 in the air, we'd send energy to space really easily. The surface of the Earth would be frozen, and we would be very unhappy, or we wouldn't be here. But as you turn up the CO2, adding more to the atmosphere, it traps more of that heat going up from the Earth, and so more CO2 makes it warmer. It's simple physics. CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. Water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, and others are also greenhouse gases. But CO2 looks like the main driver of the warming that's happening now. We know okay, so, I don't know. I, I even find myself a little more interesting than that. I'm sorry. Uh, but it's, it's a fact. And for those of you who don't understand it, you can get right here on uh, YouTube and you can go through all these videos and watch them for yourself and decide for yourself. Now, my point is that... Uh, climate change is far more complicated and uh, it will be almost impossible to really nail down what is going to happen okay so uh, when I hear people like on the news shows I watch Cenk and uh, Uger and people like that talking about how oh you know we've got tons and tons of more hurricanes well no we don't as a matter of fact we've had much worse periods of hurricanes and we've had really bad hurricanes and I keep going where are the big hurricanes I mean finally Harvey hit and it wasn't a big hurricane but boy it got tight there at the end and did a category 4 didn't it and uh, I'm sorry if I get excited about these things but I'm a on top of everything else that you know about me, I am also a storm chaser, chaser who does not have the money to put gas in his car and go chase storms. So I get excited about these things. Uh, I love storm chasing and I have tons of video. Uh, never caught a tornado. I know that I was within two or three hundred yards of uh, one several times because the weather service was saying that and because it was hailing like crazy and the lightning was amazing and uh, then I got there and like at one time uh, the road was closed because it took the took out a 7-eleven down the road so they had the road completely closed off and I was following that one and I was watching what I knew had to be a tornado it was just it was just far enough away I couldn't quite quite uh, see it and then another time I was so bad I mean it was just hailing like crazy and uh, there were a couple of times actually many times that 
It hailed and rained so hard I couldn't see it, but it was there. Uh, so I've never actually, I mean, I've always, now I've seen water spouts off the coast of Lebanon, three of them at one time, and they're enormously tall. And the, uh, it wasn't a storm, but there was a ceiling, you know, the, the and there were these huge, I mean, they weren't big, they were narrow, 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 tiny, narrow. They seem like that to me because they were 15 miles away from me. I'm living up on a mountain up above Beirut looking down. And these things were, they looked tiny. But then there was a boat down there. And I was like, oh, okay. These things are huge, you know. Probably 50 feet across. And there were there was one. And then there were three at one point. Because this, this went on for hours never seen anything like that and I can say that I know lots of people like to think uh, Lebanon and you know all this stuff that I did is so exciting and oh I get a lot of people telling me how lucky I was and stuff like that well I've seen all kinds of crazy stuff wherever I've been and I understand how you feel you know everybody wants to have the money and go around all around the world and but you certainly don't want to do it in pursuit of neocon uh, agendas and you know, the CIA and all that stuff you you really don't i mean if you and and other than that other than working for blackwater or something there really isn't a lot of opportunities because that's what's going on with america and that's how americans end up over there now if you're lucky enough to get a job with a company that's decent and go places I, I say go for it you know and and yeah seeing the world I wish everybody could do it and I don't get to do it anymore I mean I went lived in Belgium for two years uh, not too long ago and I have some amazing stories because it seems like whenever I do something <laughs> Well, let's put it this way. You're talking about the Transatlantic Partnership, right? Well, we rented out the uh, loft apartment to a kid who was running their office all by himself. He got up every day, went to their office, and he arranged all the transactions between the United States and Europe uh, to work on the transatlantic partnership. Now I learned a lot from this uh, guy. I would I would corner him every chance I got. And not to mention that, but everybody that rented from us upstairs was uh, interns at the EU. So of course I learned, and almost all of them were German. Because that's what we did to make uh, ends meet, was rented out that, uh, that loft upstairs. Okay, so back to global warming. So all I'm trying to say about global warming is that uh, don't expect it to just get hotter, you know, or storms to get massively huge or tons of snow or heat waves or whatever. Look at it a little differently. Be a little bit more sophisticated than the people who just, oh man, it's really cold today. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about there, right? I mean, that's craziness. Um, and real quick, I want to look before we go at some of the storms that have come and gone. So, you go... Hurricane... Monday, September 18th, we knew that Hurricane Hugo may come up the eastern seaboard and be a threat to the Charleston area. We had already seen the destruction Hugo had brought in St. Croix in Puerto Rico. We knew Hugo was a killer. I'm Rob Fowler. We started bringing you hourly updates on the tracking of Hurricane Hugo. We also told you to prepare in terms of buying supplies. By Wednesday, Hurricane Hugo had gotten stronger and continued moving toward us. A hurricane watch was issued. 
Nailed. Hammers and plywood are in hot demand tonight on Crawley Beach. Residents are boarding up their windows and doors in hopes of saving their beachfront property from the vicious storm. You worried it may go this time? Well, I'm not worried. I'm reconciled to it. Higher than that. And if you get over in the wildlife area over there, I suspect there's somewhere around 20. So shift it 20 miles, and you got a big problem right here. Okay. Dr. Sheets, thank you very much. A nice surprise to see you here. I know you'll be in town for a couple of days evaluating what has happened here. Thank you very much, thank Dr. Sheets. Well, we'll go back to you, a surprise visitor, one, someone we talked to long before Hugo hit, and he's here with us now again, Terry Lesson. Meantime, uh, Ren Scott, yesterday took an aerial tour of damage around the Barrier Islands in Charleston County. You went to a different place today, didn't you? Yeah, well, yesterday we were out in Barrier Islands, on uh, Folly Island, uh, Sullivan's Island. Uh. Been swinging in the wind, now it's just standing upright, and highway officials are trying to get it fixed in some way, sometime, and our TV2 St. Brian is standing by live on the Mount Pleasant side of that bridge. Say, what's the, what are the latest details on when that bridge might be fixed? Well, Terry, Leslie, first of all, let me tell you that this bridge, of course, is completely <laughs> wow. impassable. I took, up, I took a walk to the edge just a few minutes ago, and as someone who crosses this bridge almost day in and day out, it's really a tragic sight. Olive Palms Mayor, this is the latest, Olive Palms Mayor Carmen Bunch has asked Governor Carol Campbell for a makeshift bridge to help people cross. But how Okay, I've gone too we'll far. On the air or make every attempt to, to bring you the information you need to So have. I'm going now back a little bit. TV2 Action News. I'm Terry Casey. Good night. We will see you throughout the night. I went to emergency preparedness headquarters with Leslie. We were broadcasting live at 10.15 that night when the announcement came. Stay where you are. Hold secure. As the roof started to rip off the building where we were, we ended up huddled in a concrete hallway, hoping we would live. Where were you during Hurricane Hugo? That is a question that will be asked over and over again, similar to the shooting of JFK. I was here at the National Weather Service office in North Charleston, keeping you updated on the storm using their radar. It was quite scary here. A couple of times it sounded like the roof was being pulled off, and many of us ran down this hallway to the bathroom for protection. Terry Leslie and I kept Dan Ashley updated by phone. It was nearly midnight as Dan was doing an update from the transmitter. It wasn't very pretty, but Dan was the only broadcaster left on the air in <laughs> the world country. showing somebody taking him. nothing else, it was information. Good evening, everyone. Dan Ashley reporting live from our transmitter facility in Arundel. I spoke with our weather person, Rob Fowler, just a few minutes ago. He is at the National Weather Service office in North Charleston. He describes a very, situa a very serious situation where he is right now. The eye wall, apparently, Rob tells me, is now moving across Charleston. That is when we expect that tremendous storm surge. We've heard reports of up to 18 feet of water. That is now, the eye wall is now moving forward across Charleston. The eye will not get hit for perhaps another half hour or so. It's just off the coast now. Uh, wind speeds gusting up to 100 miles an hour downtown Charleston. A very serious situation. If so it, it wasn't all that it was bad. 100 miles per hour, but it did not get the 17-foot tidal surge that hit further south. This is tough, and you're going to go in with uh, one of your beating guards, okay? This morning, the South Carolina National Guard was sent in. Okay, so this isn't like the most intense part of this. Hugo was huge, and I think when it hit Cuba was the worst of it. Uh, but uh, then I also remember... Ivan. And now, part of the reason that I find this all so fascinating is because I was in Houston for Alicia, and I'm planning on getting to that one last. And I can tell you, somehow they were giving out the coordinates of the eye of the storm, and I was tracking them, and I knew they were coming. And it was late. And we had taped up all the windows, although we didn't really do a good job. But fortunately, nothing, nothing, no windows broke. Electricity went out, and it was like a couple of days, or a day at least, before uh, it came back on. <laughs> the worst thing that happened in our house is my mom wanted to uh, 
make sure we had water and she f was filling up the bathtub and she flooded our bathroom <laughs> so anyway and that was a big mess that was the worst thing that happened to us I, I'm sorry I think that's hilarious so anyway and, and I just asked her the other day and we're here in the hurricane right now what's left of it so um, I'm gonna do Alicia last and it was a bad hurricane it was as, it was worse than this one right here that they're talking about as far as what happened in South Carolina it was uh, sustained winds of uh, 95 miles an hour well they said theirs were 100 so okay same difference pretty close and gusting up to 115 and it pretty much wiped out Galveston Island uh, really destroyed all those houses now let me uh, I'm just going by memory so Ivan became a Category 4 hurricane while still east of the Lesser Antilles. The powerful hurricane then plowed its way through the Caribbean, narrowly avoiding direct hits on Jamaica, the Cayman Islands, and Cuba. Then Ivan turned northward into the Gulf of Mexico. The massive hurricane made landfall in Gulf Shores, Alabama during the very early morning hours of September the 16th. We begin the Ivan mission in Panama City Beach, Florida. Hi, Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com with John Van Pelt. We're here at Panama City Beach, Florida now. We're at the Howard Johnson's, ironically enough, where Jesse, Eddie, and I were set up for Tropical Storm Bonnie. Right now, I'll be recording as much as I can as long as the Sprint Network stays up. We can send these videos up to the website for Mark, for Mark Sutter. I am Mark Sutter for HurricaneTrack.com. I really think your heart's got to just come out of your mouth when you when you see that water coming up, right? And these guys are crazy. I don't know what the sword storm surge was. Uh, they'll probably mention it. That poor bird. Look, it's not afraid of people because it's like having to deal with this. drive around. I have some very good video right here in Lexington, some storms that have hit. I mean, hurricanes are nasty, but boy, you can get some really nasty storms sometimes pretty much anywhere in America. But in Kentucky, we've had some really good ones, and as a storm chaser, I've chased some good ones. And I have video where, well, you'll see. Someday I'll, I'll post some when I'm doing something else storm-related. Um, so, I want to do Andrew, and this is to, you know, just kind of back up what I'm saying is, whew, we've had some major storms, I mean, I remember where we had 17, 20 named storms in a year, 
I mean, over the last few years, sometimes we only get a couple. So here's this is literally a painful experience. The sand is hitting us so hard that it feels like BBs hitting your skin. What we come out of our houses to tomorrow afternoon is going to be very frightening. So you just had no idea. I had no idea that this kind of power was possible. It's just you hear about it, but once you experience it, the wind was whistling a, a death, a death wish to us. The sound of death. Everybody needs to be where they're going to be at midnight tonight. Midnight, Monday, August 24th, 1992. That was when we first began to feel the effects of the hurricane that would change our lives forever. I'm Brian Norcross. This is what's become known as the bunker here at WTVJ. This is where we spent the fiercest hours of the storm, hours that were terrifying for all of us here in South Florida. Midnight is also the time that many of you began to lose power, and with it, your ability to watch our coverage on television. In the next two hours, we're going to relive Hurricane Andrew as it happened. And we're going to begin on Tuesday, August 18th. At that time, we were tracking what was then just a tropical storm. And I don't, you know, they will die. They are pleading. They are asking any doctor, anybody with medical, per, any medical personnel to go and help out in the shelters. Are you scared? Not really. Cool, calm, and collected. At Jackson Memorial Hospital, the hallways are lined with pregnant <coughs> women. Uh, let me say this to you. I, I don't think this, uh, this um, hurricane is going to be as bad as... It's pretty plain that... Uh... A lot of old people down there. Huh? So the evacuation for South Florida should be pretty much wrapped up by now. It is just about concluded. We're expecting. And you know that in these videos, <laughs> they're acting like old people, aren't they? Hey, this thing doesn't scare me. Uh, you know, I guess because they're gonna, they're facing their death anyway. They're all old, really old. But uh, it seems to me like old people are always there. Yeah, I can remember when I lived in a bag in the middle of the road. Old Monty Python sketch. At this hour, the center of the hurricane is located about 40 miles due east of Miami. And it is a big hurricane. What do you think is going to happen to you when it starts blowing here really hard in a few, in a few hours? I'd say the wind's going to really, really blow freaking hard. <laughs> Now Wind's gonna blow freaking the hard. Huh? Area. So right. it appears now is that as we had anticipated, it's 11:59. Right. In fact, it's 12 o'clock straight up. Oh, we hit that one pretty good. We right? sure did. Okay. It's been about 90 minutes since the buses stopped rolling in Broward County. The buses that were taking evacuees from the coastal areas to the emergency shelters, and it was about 30 minutes ago that emergency coordinators suggested people stop driving. People should have been to those emergency shelters or wherever they were going about 30 minutes ago. It's not safe to be driving on these streets anymore. Standing on the beach strip in Fort Lauderdale, it's about seven or eight hours before we will feel the full strength of Hurricane Andrew. But and as we look down Ocean Drive, uh, we have spotted what may be some of the first real damage, a window that's uh, been not sense of safety it is here simply because we are underneath the metro rail right at one of the archways in the in the do not think that uh, you are in any way safe if you have not hunkered down in and, and got that mattress over you friends this is the time to do it get to that interior closet get a mattress over your head get your family in there and just wait this thing out. And Kendall? Storm shutters have, have blown off. Trees are down. Fences down. Fences down. The eye is just coming ashore there in Cutler Ridge. We have no Miami radar, so we can forget the Miami radar. The, uh, it fell off the building. All we can tell people is hang on. producer is telling us that we have an NBC reporter. Is it Bruce Hall? 
Bruce, go ahead, please. All right, a uh, couple things from the outside area of your building that you may not be aware of yet. You've lost a satellite dish out here. The fence that is around has now disappeared. What you're getting is a very hard driving rain that is coming in with gusts of wind. It is uh, throwing a lot of uh, debris and material around. To do this, I have to have another fellow hold me here because the wind and the gusts just about pick you up. And that is the way it is. I've been through a number of hurricanes in a career with uh, going through these storms. And this is among the third or fourth worst that I've ever been in. That would compare with Camille. Hugo and Frederick, which went into Mobile in the mid-70s. Bruce uh, Hall, this is Brian Norcross. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, uh, let me tell you uh, that uh, we can tell you with assuredness that here in downtown Miami, we are not in the intense part of this hurricane. The intense part of this hurricane is 10 miles south of us and, and covering the rest of Dade County to the south. Well, I don't know if you heard the report. We had Dr. Sheets on as they're trying to survive the storm at the Hurricane Center at this point. They had 152 mile per hour gusts, and here we're estimating we're experiencing something on the order of 80 to 90 mile per hour winds in downtown Miami. So that's the kind of difference we're talking about. And it is a very significant difference. And while you were talking about winds of 80 to 90 miles an hour right here, and you're protected by some buildings occasionally in the downtown area, once you get up to 150, that is a major difference. And we can tell the effects of that as we see the wind and the rain uh, and debris come through the area. And you can tell in certain areas, probably to the south as you indicate, uh, it's got to be a lot more severe than this. Well, I can, I can tell you with absolute assurance, we have people. You know, this is a privately owned building where planes have been turned upside down, torn apart, the wings destroyed on this particular private plane. Many of them just completely out of commission for a long, long time. Roof to be found on probably every house in this neighborhood. Uh, many of these people woke up uh, early this morning to glass breaking, the roofs caving down on top of them during this hurricane that hit its full force, uh, seemingly right there in that area. This must have been really scary. <laughs> There you see some of the roofs that uh, have caved in, and, and this is uh, just some of the people that uh, we talked to. The kids were saying, Mommy, what happened? Why is God doing this to Total disaster. Total. How did you come to tell President Bush? Well, uh, I think uh, all President Bush has got to do is take a look at this. Nobody will have to tell him anything. Uh, this is absolute devastation. If they're going to declare any place in America a disaster, it would have to be this one. There are concrete telephone poles lying on the ground, and there is just nothing but uh, little bitty fragments of what used to be mobile homes. Okay, Rob, do us one last favor. Just give us one last look uh, of this area. And, and is, is, is the devastation as far as you can see with your naked eye? Yeah, look at it. It's, it's as far as we can see. I mean, uh, there's an area out here that... Uh, that things uh, are looking a little better, but look at this. I mean, the, the roofs of the houses are gone, and this is a, a good mile away. Yes, I'd have to say, uh, where you see a house with a, with a roof that's even partly there, it's in pretty good shape. I mean, look at this. I mean, this, this, this alone tells you the strength of the storm. It just picks this house right apart. What about rescue personnel? Do you see emergency vehicles in there, ambulances uh, and the like? Not a lot right here. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Tom, as I worked my way down to pick up this helicopter, there were a lot of people on the road, needlessly on the road, just to get a look at what's happening. That's slowing down emergency vehicles tremendously because they can't get around. We can't urge enough for you to stay in your homes or stay in the shelter or wherever you're at. Don't go out fighting at this point because emergency crews and cleanup crews have got to be able to get over the Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know why I get so emotional. Maybe because I was in Alicia, uh, it wasn't anything like that. That eye wall, whew, when that thing comes into contact with the, the land at those 125, 150 mile, and God, some of the typhoons, 175, I think uh, 180 is the maximum that, uh, but I don't know. 
I think sometimes when you get these really big, uh, these really strong winds, uh, it probably wipes out. Oh God, look at that! There's a a boat in somebody's swimming pool. <laughs> I mean, Jesus, what is this? Teresa, oh. Teresa, look at this. Uh, certainly a huge traffic jam. Ooh. As we uh, work our way around and swing around it, I don't have, a, I can't show you all the way over to the beach. Rather over to a. So, uh, and you know, Alicia was scary. But it wasn't really as dangerous as uh, we had a tornado go right down the road uh, near us. And uh, I was okay. Didn't even know it happened, you know. But, uh, so I was sitting in my bedroom with my head up against the wall. Uh, and all of a sudden, I just felt this. Heard this. First I heard this. You know that sound? when the air is getting sucked out of the room and the wall behind me maybe an inch lifted up and lift pushed against my head and my back and after from then on we were in Hurricane Alicia let's see if we can find something that yeah, this isn't too long. Good song, huh? Do any of you uh, old enough to know that that's the... Uh, Oh, is that the scorpions? So it says Alicia formed from a large cluster of thunderstorms that organized off of the Mississippi and Alabama coast. Within 48 hours, Alicia became a small but pa powerful Category 3 hurricane that had its path set for Houston. So it formed along the coast, but it, I know it came straight in because I was tracking it. There's a picture of it as it, as it hit. At 1.35 a.m. Central Daylight Time, Alicia made landfall between Galveston and Freeport, Texas. Uh, Winds at Galveston were closed, clocked at 131. <laughs> Alicia uh, pounded southeast Texas on August 18, 1983. Uh, I got there January 83, uh, with major damage reported across the Houston area. Here are some of some of the pictures. Yeah, I remember I mean on Galveston Island, the the houses that were all up on stilts were they were gone. Yeah, that's a hotel that's on a a dock, and it got badly damaged. These were the houses that I remembered being completely gone. Now that's a picture they're trying to get the storm surge so there was I mean these I believe are all on stilts maybe this one isn't maybe that's one.
Now, I'll tell you, Galveston, the, well, actually, I mean, these houses were all pretty nice, but uh, it could look a little trashy down around the beach, so... <laughs> Um, what I remember is that on the big buildings, one window would break up high and it would blow glass into the side of the building and it would start up as one little place and then it would just widen up and the glass would be broken all because, you know, they talk about Houston as being like from, uh, the Emerald City because there's all these big buildings. Uh, Meanwhile, along the upper Texas Gulf Coast, the cleanup for Malaysia is now well underway. Residents are having to cope with problems like flooding, power failures, and contaminated drinking water. Channel 4's Clarice Tinsley and Dan Gopler would have been covering the story. Here now is Clarice. Good evening from Houston, a city that's working hard to put itself back together after Hurricane Alicia ripped through yesterday. This is the first full day of cleanup operations. It's also the first day Southeast Texas residents are returning to homes and businesses to survey the damage left in Alicia's wake. We have two reports on cleanup efforts tonight. First, Channel 4's Nan Doppler Rouge from Galveston Island. Yeah, see, there you go. Most of these structures were relatively new, something that concerns the mayor. That many people no longer use nails, they use staples. And it's generally recommended that you use clamps. So I'm not sure that that is sufficient to withstand wind loads such as we get in the event of hurricane. In fact, many old houses came through the storm relatively unscathed. But some homeowners have a big job ahead. Damage here in Galveston alone is estimated now at $500 million, and it may go higher than that. Water and electrical service are expected to be returned to normal by Monday. But for many residents here, it will be a lot longer than that. Okay, so... What Alicia did to this island. That's what I remember. Uh, I remember in the morning, uh, mid-morning, you could get out and walk around. And you could lean over till your head was only about three feet off the ground and walk into the wind and it would hold you up. But, uh, so, you know, I think I've made my point. I mean, we have alarmists on our side. We have the people on the other side. See, there's where the windows were all broken out. And you can see how they would, well, not in that particular case, but on some of the green ones that I noticed. You can see that. So, you know, it would break once and, and then they, the glass would break the other glass. But uh, as far as climate change goes, it, there's no rhyme or reason to it. I mean, there is, but you're not going to be able to predict it. You know, and neither is anybody else, neither are these people, these experts. So Lexington is at the very center. Of this picture and that's what's left of Harvey and it's moving on through looks like it's producing massive storms down there so this is us and here uh, I'll let you see what it looks like out my window which it's still blustery and windy and and cold, but uh, here.
was much worse earlier. The wind was much higher and the, a lot of rain. Not quite flooding yet, but there we had a lot of rain. So there you go. Because <laughs> I know you got to be tired if you've been watching this whole show, but uh, Harvey is still raising hell. Two tornadoes on the ground. Looks like Arkansas, Fayetteville. Um, probably about to be hit. Let me see if I can knock down the opacity. Nah, it won't. It won't affect the. Okay, so I'm gonna leave the opacity up. So this. So there's a tornado on the ground headed for Fayetteville, which is quite a large city, and then. I'm going to turn off the alerts just enough to see. So, Raleigh, oh my god. If a tornado hits Raleigh, that's. <laughs> that would be a major disaster. Turn off these. And. You know, it's this is what's generating this. I mean, this is probably the storm that went through the other day. It wasn't anything. You know, it just blew on through. And now this is lending it, it its energy. That's what's going on there. And I got to tell you, I mean, this is... Uh, I'm going to have to Google this real quick and see. Get your advertisements out of my face. Here's a tornado warning issued from Hornet, Johnson, Wake Counties. This was at 2.35. It's now 5. Okay, these are not good. It's hard. It's, it's hard to gather news on the internet. Uh, but uh, I enjoy it. Anyway, so suffice to say, once again, you know, is this weather, uh, is this climate change or, or not? I don't know. And I'm not going to pretend to know. But uh, this is definitely, if it is climate change, this shows how unpredictable it is. I mean, this is uh, definitely a front from earlier in the week, and Harvey's turning it into something else. Yeah, pretty sure of that. We got two major tornadoes here. They're not going away. They've they've been going for a little while. We can see tornado warning doesn't give much in the way of information tornado warning well you can by the time you watch this you'll know what what happened okay Where were we attacked? We were attacked in downtown Manhattan, where Wall Street is. I did spend a whole lot of time and effort helping them rebuild. That was good for New York, it was good for the economy, and it was a way to rebuke...